Well, tonight is, uh, tonight's a little bit different. Um, there's two stools up here. Uh, we're in the foundation series uh, where we are talking about some things that are important for us to understand. Uh, we came out of a pretty heavy, pretty weighty series this summer um, that we called Gray Areas, where we looked at some things that weren't necessarily easy to answer, uh, and we wrestled with those. And I use that metaphor because it's in the Bible, people that literally wrestled with the presence of God. And so uh, one of the things that we want to do tonight, and Michael's joining me here on stage, is we're going to kind of tag team teach a little bit tonight. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do is we don't want to take for granted that some of the terms that are thrown out in the Bible and by Christians Christianese, if you will. We don't want to assume that everybody knows what is, uh, what is meant when they're said. Like, for instance, last week, discipleship. That's the process of not only knowing Jesus, but then following him. And so last week we talked quite a bit about what it means to know Jesus and to follow him. And tonight we're going to talk about worship. We're going to talk about what worship means. Um, you know, I remember when I was in the third grade, I stumbled upon something uh, that, that was life-changing, and it was the original Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, yeah, you got some fans out there. Those of you who are second-generation Nintendo guys with the Wii and all that, that's great and all, and it's, the <laughs> graphics are much, much better, I know. But, like, when I stumbled upon this, there were things such as the cartridge entitled Kung Fu. And, and Russian Attack, and Metroid. And here's the deal. My dad couldn't understand why these things were so important to me. It's just a game. And I said, you don't understand this. It is so much more than just a game. It transports me into a whole new world. It is a game, but it is so much more than just a game. And when we talk about concepts, and when we talk about spiritual words that are found in the Bible, sometimes you could define them as, yeah, that's just like it sounds. Okay, for instance, this is a Bible. It's a Bible. It's God's Word. But it's much more than just a book. It's God revealing himself to us. And in the, the, the first century, in the second century, a lot of biblical scholars and teachers often refer to the Bible like a diamond. And when you hold a diamond up, some of you have diamond rings on tonight, when you hold those diamonds up or your earrings and you hold them up in the light, depending upon how you twist, how you turn them, what the light looks like, you see a different side of that diamond. Same diamond, but a whole new aspect. It's so much more. And a lot of times the biblical scholars said, every time I look at God's word in a different way, I just fall in love with it even more and even more. And we seem to do that sometimes. We, we think we might know a word, but you scratch and dig a little bit deeper, and it's so much more. And so tonight what Michael and I want to do is we want to talk about worship. And, and we feel like sometimes when we say worship, worship is, yes, we come and we sing and we praise, but it's so much more than just that. Several years ago, I read a book by an author named Louis Giglio. He's a Christian speaker, preacher, teacher. Many of you probably know him. Uh, you watch his sermons. But he wrote a book called The Air I Breathe. And he talked about what worship is. And so as Michael and I were preparing for this, what's interesting is that's the, he, he kind of coined a definition. There's a lot of definitions for worship, but I found that when I read that about four or five years ago, I thought, man, he summed it up really well what worship is. So when I'm talking to Michael, Michael said, well, you know, here's the definition I'm thinking we're working from, and it was the same one. So God just opened this guy's mouth, gave us a definition that we can build on. And so I want to show you what that definition is. And, and here's what it is. It's there on the screen in, from his book. It says, worship is our response, both personal and corporate. So it's individual and it's corporate. We're here gathered together corporately to God. It's our response to him for who he is and what he's done, expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some different passages tonight. We're going to dissect those passages. We're going to talk about what worship is. But here's what I want us to do. I want us to look at it in two ways. We kind of want to split this definition in half. So here's what we're going to kind of look at first. The first thing we want to look at is the first part of this. Worship is our response, both personal and corporate to God, for who he is and what he's done for us. Michael's going to kind of tackle that a little bit and walk with us through some of the scripture to see what that means, that it's our response to God. But then I'm going to kind of walk us through a little bit the second part of this definition, which is this, that it is expressed, that worship is not just responding, but that it is expressed in so much more than we could possibly fathom or that maybe some of us realize. It's expressed in and by the things that we say 
and the way that we live. So we're a little excited. Uh, we're a little bit interested in how God is going to speak and work through us, kind of tandem teaching tonight. Um, but I love Michael's heart for worship. And because he's our worship leader here and he prepares and gets his heart and his mind ready to lead us towards Christ, I think it's fitting for him to lead us off tonight talking about how worship is a response. And then I'll step in in just a minute and talk about kind of how that fleshes itself out corporately when we're together and then individually when we are sent out on our own. Um, one of the most profound moments that I had um, in learning about worship was taught to me by my six-year-old niece. And uh, some of you may have heard me share this story. It's amazing how much kids can teach you if you just listen to them a little bit. Um, but they, my, both my nieces, Rachel, who is six, and Bella, who at the time was like three down here, they came to Nashville and wanted to visit um, Uncle Mike and Aunt Keeley. And, uh, and so they came to town in a minivan. My parents were there. My sister and their two kids were all riding around. Well, they didn't know where they were going once they got to Nashville. So I became the designated driver, which was an odd sight seeing me driving a bunch of kids in a minivan because I don't have any kids. So people are like, is that Michael in the van with a bunch of kids? And, and it was true. But as we were driving through downtown Franklin, um, Rachel starts singing in the back. And she goes, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Somebody did. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your life will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. She didn't stop there. She went on. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. You guys are really into this. If you're happy and you know it, then your life will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. And she did. She said, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. Oh, she went on, if you're happy and you know it, turn around. I'm trying to figure out how to drive and turn around at the same time. If you're happy and you know it, bob your head. And she's just making up stuff at the end. But really, at the end of this song, it, it was crazy to me because it got quiet all of a sudden. And it hit me what my six-year-old niece was doing in the van that day. She was leading our entire family in worship. And here's the reason why. And this sounds trite at first, but I think there's something deeper here. Because the lyrics she was singing matched the life she was living. The lyrics she was singing matched the life she was living. She was happy and she knew it. And as a worship leader, I'm sitting here going, I try to get people to do what you just did effortlessly. And it was because her life was matching the same lyric that she was singing. And so Aaron mentioned the definition for worship. Worship is a response. It's a response to God for who he is and what he's doing. That's what worship is. It's a response. What we just finished doing in a musical context was us responding to God, I think one of the, one of the stories that, that was in the book that Aaron mentioned that Louis tells is, uh, is, is about a guy that was basically in, in, a, in a big indoor pool area, and that indoor pool area had a huge high dive on it, really tall high dive. And, and there was two guys that were diving, and the first guy was like just Mr. Smooth. You know, he was one of those guys that was just like, he was ripped up and cut and he was tanned and he kind of did that with his hair and his hair all fell perfectly one way. And he would walk up to the edge of the diving board, take one leap and do all kinds of twists and turns and just land in the water without a splash. And people were like, man, that's, that's pretty impressive. But the guy who stole the show was a guy with shaggy red hair, pale complexion, overweight, canary yellow swim trunks, and he got up to the diving board, took one giant leap, and did the biggest cannonball that he could. And this, if you were in the vicinity of the pool, you were getting wet, okay? That's, I mean, people went crazy, and so it inspired this guy to do it again. And so he climbed, he swam over to the edge and climbed up the ladder again and jumped off the high dive and did another cannonball, and people went even more crazy this time. So this guy does this about five or six times, and you know as well as I do that a guy like that that's out of shape who's climbing up a ladder six times in a row is going to get tired, okay? He's starting to breathe heavy and decides he's going to do it one last time, and so he literally steps up there, steps up on the edge of the diving board, goes to jump, and when he does, he slips, and his tush hits the diving board and propels him this way 
sort of like this, only his legs were straight out too. And it said that everybody all at the same time went, <gasps> and he said, smack and did like the world's best belly buster ever and so people are going crazy he's getting out of the pool and his just whole body is red you know you've just seen that guy and it's just one of those things where it's like oh no he said but the amazing thing was in that story that louis says that everybody in the pool went because they saw what was ha about to happen and were responding to what was about to happen. And I wonder if just the people in this room right now were to really see God for who he is and what he has done, if our response would be something like that. If our response would be, oh, wow, maybe we might even start the process early Every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord. But some of us, some of us don't see God. We don't know what's going on with him. And you know why, if I can just be blunt and honest, it's because we don't spend time with him. We don't walk with him. We just don't. We have a spiritual vision problem because we simply aren't walking with him. You know, one of the um, years and years ago when Keely and I first started dating, Keely was up here just a second ago. Didn't she do a great job? I'm really proud of her. <laughs> totally not going to be cool after this. She's going to dog me for that. But um, um, when Keely and I were first, were first starting to date, we decided that we were going to get tandem cell phones because we thought it would save us money. In the dating, she lived in Oklahoma and I lived here in Nashville. And uh, after our first bill, um, I think my first bill was like near $500. Um, and I was broke and didn't have any money. Her bill was more than that. <laughs> and, and so we quickly discovered other ways to talk to each other. And, and we found one of those ways um, was to write letters to each other and, and write cards. I know it's like totally old school now because we can send emails and all that kind of stuff. But we decided to, to write cards and, and to send letters. And I remember walking to the mailbox at my apartment complex and opening it up 409 and seeing that I had a letter from Keely in there. And it was like, yes. And, you know, she'd usually put something on the back of the envelope like, I love you. And I'd be like, yes. <laughs> And, and I, would open, I would open the envelope up and I would read it and it would always, you know, start out with some sort of little name that she would give me, um, you know, and, and I would read through the letter and I'd wait until she said something like, man, you are everything I've been looking for in a guy, which I'm not sure she ever said that, but I wanted her to say that. <laughs> it, sound, it sounds good. It sounds it's, good. It sounds, sounds good. good. It sounds good for the story. I'm not sure she ever said that, but I know really there were really sweet things that she would write to me, and I would memorize them. Like, after I read it a couple of times, you didn't, I didn't need the letter anymore because it was internalized. I, I would memorize the way she would close the letter. She, I would memorize the PS in the letter. I would memorize the next letter that came, and I would send her a card or, or some sort of letter, and she would do the same thing. And I got to know Keely even better through reading what she wrote me. When we had the chance, which we still did, to talk on the phone, I got to know Keely that way as well. And before long, that... I, I could hear Keely's voice and know that it was her without a doubt. I could tell by the way that she would say things. I could tell in the way that she would write that it was her because I spent time with her. I spent time getting to know her. And some of us have a spiritual vision problem. We aren't responding to God because we don't see him as he is. We don't spend time in his word. We aren't spending time in prayer. And those are just a few ways that we can spend time with God. His word says that if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Worship is, is, is at its best, in my opinion, when we are obedient to Jesus and to his will. Worship is a response and some of us, and I think this is some of us tonight, just to be honest, I think this is some of us tonight. How we see God right now in this moment is determining how we worship him. 
How you see God in this very moment is determining how you worship him. And it goes back to something that Aaron mentioned just last week when he said there's a difference between knowing God and following him. There's a difference between knowing God and following him. And so as we look at the next point that Aaron's going to talk about, I want us to think about what it means not just to know God and to see him, but to actually walk with him, to follow him into this world. One of the scriptures we want to put up on the screen is Romans chapter 12. It's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And what you may want to do is if you don't have a Bible, you may want to write this down. Uh, You may want to go back and watch this or listen to this later. Michael did, Michael presented that worship is a response to who God is and what he's done for us. Paul said it this way. This is where we get that kind of statement. It's not what Michael thinks. It's not what I think. It's not what another definition is. It's what the scriptures say. God himself, especially through the apostle Paul, says this in Romans 12.1. Therefore, uh, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. In the Old Testament, as many of you know, you would go and you would offer a sacrifice in the temple, and that sacrifice was what I like to call a one-hit wonder, okay? It was very serious, it was very important, but the system was set up so that if you sinned or there was something that separated you and God, you would take your sacrifice in, the priest would offer atonement for your sin, for your separation from God, and the sacrifice would be burnt up, it would be sacrificed, it would be consumed on the altar, only good for a one-time use. And what Paul is saying is, if worship is a response to God, as we've heard it in our modern context, in response to God for who he is and what he's done for us, the scripture clearly tells us that God looked upon us and he realized that in our brokenness there was no way for us to get to God. And each and every one of us, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time talking about that there are problems in the world and there's brokenness in the world. I mean, some mornings I wake up and I just feel all jacked up and I haven't even done anything. And I feel, I feel like I'm, I'm inadequate and I don't know where those thoughts come from and I don't know where those things just pop out of, but sometimes I feel like I have missed the mark. And God looked in on our condition and said, you cannot fix yourself. You cannot get back to me. You cannot redeem your brokenness and your own inadequacies. However, I will send my son. I will insert him into the human story. And the scripture says, because we have flesh and blood, Jesus could have come as any form, anything he wanted to be. But he gave up his privilege and his authority in heaven or his privilege and his honor in heaven to insert himself into the story, into humanity, to become one of us so that he could understand what it feels like to have people that are against you, to understand what it feels like to have people that betray you, to understand what it feels like to hurt and to mourn and to understand what it feels like to laugh and to be so excited about life. Jesus totally understands all those things. And he inserted himself into the story to say, I totally understand how you feel, but you still have a sin condition, an inadequacy that separates you from God. So therefore, I will lay my life down on the altar. Now this is a a platform, this is a stage, but you might have heard that like steps or platforms in churches are often called the altar, and it is symbolic of the front of the worship experience where back in the day the priest would lay the sacrifice down to pay, to atone for the sin of the individual. And when it was offered to God, and when it was received by God, God looked upon that as punishment, as payment for the sin condition of the individual, and it was wiped away and they were reconciled back into a right relationship with God. And it was just as if they had never sinned before. And so Jesus says, I will lay down my life. Now his altar, his platform where he sacrificed his body was on a hill called the place of the skull, Golgotha, where he said, I'll die and I'll put myself in your position. And when I go as your high priest to offer the sacrifice, once I do this, you'll never have to go to a priest again. You'll never have to do religion again. You'll never have to work to earn your way or work your way back into a right relationship with God. That when I do this, if you will simply look upon what I've done through my death in place of yours so that you can continue living and choose whether or not you want to follow me and receive what I've done for you, 
then this will be a once and for all sacrifice that you can be redeemed, that you will have the opportunity to be made whole, that you will ultimately live forever as a reward of your faith in me with God forever in a place where there's no mourning, there's no crying, there's no tear, there's no pain, but you don't have to wait till you get there to enjoy this relationship. I want to work in and through you right now, which is what we talked about last week where we said God changes your head You start to follow him and your heart is changed and then your hands are changed where Jesus says, I want to work in and through you right now to make a difference right here where you live. And Paul says that when each of us hit rock bottom, and for some of us it's in the mess of our own mistakes. That's been me sometimes. The only way God got a hold of my attention is there was nowhere to go but up. So I said, I'll try it. And I grew up in church. Sometimes I ran from him. And I said, I'll try it. And he's, this is how good God is. And he's still there. The invitation's still there. Do you want it? Yes, I do. And from that point forward, God started showing me my identity in him. He started removing my sin. He started taking it away when I confessed it to him and said, do a work in me. And he told me my name. He told me, you are beloved. You are loved. I am pleased with how I've created you. Now, let's build a life together through the presence of of the risen Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit. Let's do this together. And Paul says, if that's ever happened to you, that you say, like some people do, Jesus is the best thing. I've been looking for something to fix me and make me whole, and I've been medicating, and I've been looking for relationships, and that's what I've been looking for. Paul says, if that's you, and you've placed your faith in Jesus, and you've received what he's offered, then offer your body not as a one-time sacrifice. And as one preacher once said, the problem with a living sacrifice is sometimes it crawls off the altar. But he says, instead of being lay your life down and then just move on, he said this. Lay your life down. And lay your life down in response to what God has done for you that you and I did not deserve. We could not earn. We could not work for. How good is he to do that for you and me? If you have been moved, if you have any encouragement, Paul told the church in Philippi, he said this, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, and those words mean since, since you have encouragement, since you have unity, since you have comfort, since you have found love in Jesus, since you have found fellowship with his spirit and Michael and I have fellowship because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. The church is a collection of people who profess Jesus and share in and of his Holy Spirit. If you found that, Paul says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. That's a response. Paul says, if you have felt moved by the good news of Jesus, give your life back to him. Offer it back up as a sacrifice. Our lives are an act of worship because we literally say, I don't know where I'd be without you, Jesus. Take it all. Take it all. Have it. Offer it back. It's a response to God for literally who he is and what he's done for us. You know, in the first century church, when people gave their lives to Christ, and in particular, Acts chapter 2 tells us that there were 3,000 people that heard Peter preach and they said, I want Jesus. And they followed, and they, they did this number. Like I stood in different places last week, I believe, I want Jesus. And they realized that Jesus called them not only to believe, but to follow. And so professing Jesus wasn't good enough. They wanted more. And so then they started living in community. Now what that means is this. They started sharing in and of the Holy Spirit together. They would meet to study God's word. They would meet to pray with one another. They would meet, meet to mourn with one another, to laugh with one another. They would give to each other. If what I have is what you need, you can have it here. Jesus is my treasure. Take this. They lived together in community. It wasn't just about belief. It was about following Jesus, and their hearts and their hands and their minds were changed in the process. But one of the interesting things that happens in Acts 2, 46 and 47 is they met daily. What they wanted to do was come up with some consistency in when and where they met. And throughout time and history, people have offered their worship, have offered their response to God in regular scheduled worship services. The church would get together to worship on an appointed day, the first of the week, 
so that they could worship and bring their praise to God. Now, I have to believe this. If we didn't schedule worship services, if we didn't regularly schedule worship and come into church, I firmly believe that Christians would seek out other Christians because of the desire to share Jesus together, because of the mutual desire to share what God is doing in and through us through the power of his Holy Spirit. That is one of the things Michael and I share in common. I love to hear what he sees God doing, not only here in Nashville, but around the United States. I love to share that with him. I love to share that with others. And I truly think this is so because when you see in places where persecution runs rampant in other parts of the country where you can't have public worship services, the people risk their lives to get together so that they can worship God, even if they have to whisper And even if they only have half the Bible or a sheet, one sheet of the Bible with one part of one letter of Paul, Christians get together to worship God. And so we see that throughout time, people have said we regularly want to meet to worship God. So the definition was, worship is a response to God for who he is and what he's done. Now what I want to look at briefly is I want to look at the second part of that definition, which is this that not only is worship our response, both personal and corporate, but it's expressed in and by the things we say and we live. Do you remember earlier when I said, yes, it's a Nintendo console, but it's so much more. Yeah, it's the Bible, but the more you study it and the angle you look at it like a diamond, the more it comes alive. It's so much more. Yes, Worship is what we're doing in this place tonight, but it's also so much more. Now, our definition is it's personal and it's corporate. The word corporate, personal means individual. The word corporate means a collection or a gathering of those people who profess Christ. And so what I'd like to do is look at how it is expressed in the things we say and the way we live. And since we're gathered together, I kind of want to look at things corporately. And here's what I want to read to you. I want to read a scripture to you from Colossians. This comes from Colossians chapter 3. It's Paul's letter to the churches, church in Colossae. And here's what it says. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Here comes Paul with another one of those. Since Jesus has been so good to you. Now, in light of that, therefore, here's our response. He says this, Colossians 3.15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The word rule there is like an umpire. It's like an umpire who has the final call. Since Jesus has done this for you, he's the head of the bride, he's the head of the body, he's the head of the church, of which he purchased you, the body, corporately with his own blood. He's the head, he rules, and his rule is one of peace. So it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members, a collection of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful, which means respond in gratitude to the gospel. Be thankful in how you live. Be thankful in what you say. Even if you feel like nothing is going your way, if you are a Christ follower, and nothing else is going your way. If Jesus never did anything else for me, I owe him everything. And I mean that here and in the quiet of my home when I sit there and nobody's around and I have me and my thoughts. I know I owe him everything. If he never did anything else for me other than offer me salvation. And Paul says, be thankful because of that. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ, in the beginning was the word. That's Jesus. Let the word, Jesus himself, dwell in you. Do things. Leverage your lives so that you think and spend time meditating on who Jesus is. And we come together to do that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And it says, look at what it says. Let Christ dwell in you richly as you teach, as you admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. Now here's what's interesting. Paul finishes this passage in verse 17 by saying this. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What Paul has just done, 
We may have given you a Christ follower's definition that was our starting point. But what we're building our lives upon and what we're telling you about worship is found here in God's revelation to us. We build what we do. We build what we say. We build what we call you to come and follow Jesus on on how God has revealed himself, his word alone, and through the authority and the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit. And what we see when we read this is that Paul is unpacking that your worship is a response, and verses 15 and 16 are corporate. He says, here are some of the things you should do when you get together. And verse 17 is him saying, and this kind of encompasses what you do personally and individually. So I just read some of those things, but throughout the full complement of Scripture, there's a lot of Scripture that tell us what we should do when we get together. Now, you may have a personal preference of what you like to do, how you like the room set up, or you may have been to a church, you say, I like how this is set up, or how they do this, and preference is fine. But again, we're going to go back to what the Bible says we should do and how we should spend our time when we come in here on Tuesday night. So let me share with you on the screen real quickly. When we come together corporately, these are the things that the scripture clearly tells us we should do when we're together. We gather regularly ever since the first church got together to do what? We come together for preaching, to hear someone not talk about themselves, not talk about um, funny stories, not to talk about anything other than the person of Jesus Christ. When Michael and I, when Mike and I, and when anybody tells you illustrations and things like that, it's to communicate God's word in a way where we say, oh, yeah, I'm tracking with you. But the end result of Michael's heart, of my heart, and Mike's heart is certainly that you leave here with the essence of Jesus all over you and that you leave thinking and remembering and talking about Jesus and not us. The sermon, the preaching is biblical to gather us together to hear God's word. The Bible says we gather for the ordinances. may sound like a big bulky word, but what that means is we gather together to observe two things that Jesus established and said, when you get together, I want you to do these things. One is baptism. When we get together, we are supposed to, from time to time, it's more of a frequency question and a preference question, but we know it's a command to observe baptism. Actually, next Tuesday night, in this very room, we're going to observe and celebrate believers, someone who believes in Jesus, believers' baptism. We're going to have it next Tuesday night in here where we celebrate the physical picture of someone being buried with Christ and being raised again to a born-again, brand-new, forgiven, unblemished life in Christ. We have information about that on the website. If you're interested in being baptized, you come find me or a decision counselor. If you've professed Christ and want to get in on that, or if you say, what, what, what is baptism? Go to the website, check it out. We've got more information for you there. We also get together for the Lord's Supper, which is something we're going to do in a few weeks, where Jesus said, when you get together and you participate in sharing in the bread, the breaking of bread and the drinking from this cup, You remember my body, like the bread that was broken for you, my body that was broken and and beaten for you, because by my stripes, by my the beating that he took and absorbed on his way to the cross and at the cross, by his wounds we are healed. There's healing in the wounds of Jesus Christ. And we remember that when we get together. And also his blood. The blood is crucially huge. We get together not because it's a gory thing or to freak us out, but we get together to talk about the blood of Christ because without it shedding, there's no forgiveness for sins. And we are left in our own brokenness. But because of the body, because of the blood, it changes everything. So we get together to observe and remember what Jesus has done for us. We get together to pray. We get together to read God's word together. We get together to study it. Financial giving, we come, we did that just a minute ago through our tithes and offerings to say here. We see generosity in the New Testament. The believers got together, they pulled their resources together and said, hey, he got nowhere to sleep this evening. And he's got no way to put food in his children's bellies. So here, just put it all together on the table and whatever you need, you take it. They got together to give furniture. They got together to give other things that were more important so that they could have what they needed. We get together for financial giving so that we can say, here, God, collectively take our resources and change people's life in a culture that has an economy where we can meet those needs. And we get together for singing and for music. 
And the reason we wanted to talk about worship tonight is I spent most of my life thinking worship was a song. That all it was was a song. We come together to worship. But worship is a response. So these are some of the things we do corporately when we are gathered, when we are assembled, when we are collected. But here's what's interesting. Scripture's right there. Colossians 3, 15 and 16. Many other passages in the Bible for you to read about what we do when we're together. And Paul gives us some instruction. But he finishes by saying this. Not only is it just when you gather together, and hear me clearly, you, you might refer to this as a worship experience, or somebody might say that's a worship event, meaning it happens at a unique moment in time. That's the Greek word kairos. It, yeah, it does. It's Tuesday night from roughly 7 to 8 o'clock. And it's important that those of us who profess Christ come together each week to respond and worship to God. And there's something so powerful in us worshiping together in this room. But in just a few minutes, we're all going to scatter. And we're going to go places. And we're going to go all over this city and all over this country in the next few days. And so Paul says, not only is it when you get together, but it's so much more than that. And he says in verse 17 of Colossians 3, and whatever you do, whatever you do as an individual, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him and giving thanks to God the Father through him. So there is a corporate part of worship, but there's also a personal part of worship. And so I thought it might be helpful for us to look at some of the things that this has implications for for us personally. Now you may hear me sometimes say where you live, work, and play. And in our church we talk about sharing the good news of Jesus, where you live, where you work, where you play. We're talking tonight about worshiping, responding to God where we live, where we work, and where we play, which means this. We come together to worship. When we conclude and say good night, great to see you, see you next week. Worship is not over. Worship is not over. Because we see here that Paul said, whatever you do, whether word or deed, meaning your life is an act of worship. So you look at some of these words. Our conversations are an act of worship. Our attitudes, our thoughts are an act of worship. Our actions, our relationships are an act of worship. Our purchases, what we do with our finances, are an act of worship. Our service, what we do with our hands, is an act of worship. And our motives, what drives us to do what we do, whether in word or deed, is an act of worship. It's a fact. The scriptures tell us so. Michael and I had this conversation this week where I said, everything can be an act of worship. And Michael said in a roundabout way, you know, everything is worship. So we, we dug around on that a little bit and we both realized, you know, that's right. I was saying that everything, these things, where we live, where we work, where we play, the relationships we have, the thoughts that we have, the actions that we take, the relationships that we enter into, the career choices that we make, they can be acts of worship if we offer them to God in response. Michael reminded me that's true, but if you don't offer them, then they're worshiping something else. Because sometimes we pursue a relationship with someone or something thinking that that will complete what we're looking for. And what we have done, rather than responding to God in worship and worshiping Jesus, what we have done is we are worshiping that relationship. Here's a real good litmus test. What do you spend your money on? I was sitting in a sermon one time and a guy said, what do you spend your money on? Because whatever you spend your money on, go look at your bank statement. Whatever you spend your money on, I'm pretty sure that'll tell you if you have an idol in your life and what your idol is. And I went back and looked at what I spent my money on. And it, it just led a little path all the way to the thing that was most important to me at that point in my life. John Calvin said, the heart, the heart is a factory of idols. Your heart without Jesus will offer up idols all day long to your thoughts, to your attitude, to your behaviors. And Paul says, here's the deal. If Jesus dwells in you, then not only do you know him, but he is currently wanting to change, transform, conform you to look more like him so that your hands, your relationship, your heart, the thoughts you have, the attitudes you have, the career choices you make, so that those things can be offered up to him as worship. And those things happen 
when we leave this corporate gathering and go out into the world. Now, I got a feeling, some people call this a dress rehearsal for heaven. I don't like that metaphor. Because I don't think this is dress rehearsal. I think we're, we're doing it now. But I do know this. Forever is a mighty long time. And if I'm going to be worshiping God forever, I do want to go ahead and start participating now. Yeah. I, I, I do. Now, sometimes I don't know how to get there. I'm like, I, I, I do. I want that. I, but I don't know how to get there. So I want to encourage you with something. No matter how you feel on a Tuesday, if life has kicked you in the teeth, I hope that you will ask Jesus to give you the strength to come in and worship with us so that you can be reminded that if you got nothing else going for you, Jesus loves you, he cares about you, and he died for you. If things are really good, really good, and you're kind of thinking, I don't, I don't, I'm good, like I don't, I don't know if, you know, maybe we don't rationalize I don't need church right now. But just come on in anyway. We don't attend weekly because God will be pleased with our regular attendance. As Mike says, that's not on the final. We come together so that we can stay rooted in the truth of Jesus. So that our hearts don't get too full of ourselves when things are going well. Whatever's going on in your life, do not forsake getting together corporately with other Christians. Some of you attend here on Tuesday nights and you attend other places on Sunday morning. Here's what I want you to be about in life. I want you to know Jesus. Michael and I want you to know Jesus more than anything else. We do. Wherever you choose to worship regularly, keep doing it so that you can worship with others, which is biblical, and how God uses us not only to respond in Him in worship, but also to minister to others, to meet those needs, and to do things corporately. But wherever you go, wherever you live, work, and play, Michael and I want to challenge you tonight to embrace worship, not just as an event, but as a lifestyle. So if no one has asked you to think about that, it was one of the most profound things that somebody asked, what are the things in my life I was worshiping? I could identify my idols pretty quickly. Whatever was in my life that wasn't pointing me back to Jesus was an idol, and then I had to dig into getting rid of it. But whatever you're doing in your life, I would like to encourage you to consider tonight where you live, where you work, and where you play. What are you worshiping? If you belong to Jesus, he desires for you to respond to him in worship and to make much of him so that other people, deep down inside like we know, and we've met him and he's changed our lives so other people can experience that too. If you've wandered away from him, it's never too late to become the man or woman of Christ that you might have been. Just come on back home to him. But if you're visiting and you show up at a worship service or you hear me say live, work, and play, everything can be worship, but that, you, know, you don't follow Jesus and you're not sure what that looks like, here's the deal. This is why as Christians we need to follow Jesus and not just profess him because other people are watching our worship. Other people are watching our worship. And I'm going to put us out there, Christians, but I hope we would live this way anyway. Me too. So this is a conviction and an accountability thing for me. I pray that our worship, not only when we get together, but where we live, work, and play, would be in spirit and in truth, as Jesus said it should be, so that other people around us see our Jesus and see how good and how wonderful and how life-changing he is. Not us. And that people are given the opportunity to either choose to follow Jesus or to say, no, thank you. That's not our choice. That's not our responsibility. But I pray that we would not only worship when we get together, but where we live, where we work, and where we play. Now, again, you may need some, okay, well, what does that look like lived out? Keely sat up here and gave you a great example of an act of worship, where you live, work, and play. If you're interested in getting involved in the Nashville Rescue Mission and giving your time, giving your energy, giving your efforts, go see Keely when you leave tonight. If it's something else, I want to live a life of worship, where can I get plugged in serving and making much of Jesus Come see them. Every night, there are decision counselors down here on the stage, people who would love to pray with you, listen to your story, and just talk with you and introduce themselves to you. At the end of every night, if you want to, you stay where you are, make your way up here, nondescript, however you want to do it. There are people sitting here to listen to you, and it's our privilege to pray with you. If that's your response, hey, I want, I want to respond, and I want a life of worship, but I'm not sure how I get there, come talk to us. We not only want to hold this up, but then we want to help you get there because Michael and I are trying to get there ourselves. So here's what I want us, want us to do tonight. Let me pray for us. 
We've talked about how worship is a response and it's a way of life, but it has many expressions. It's in the things we do. It's in the things we say. Let me just pray for us and ask us to ask God to give us a heart that would embrace worship, not just as an event, but as a way of life. So here's what I'd like for you to do. Would you guys just, just make yourself comfortable, bow your head and close your eyes if that helps you kind of shut out the noise around you? And here's what I'd like to do. If you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christ follower and Jesus has come into your life, and you know that the call is not only to profess him, but then to follow him, just, just in these moments, ask him to give you his heart and his mind so that you can follow him and live a life of worship.